Welcome everyone to our first alumni speaker of the academic year. We're very excited to have Danny with us. Danny graduated just recently, well, not, not that recently, <laughs> with his MBA, and he's going to be speaking today about personal finance and cyber hygiene. So give me just a moment and I'm going to go ahead and share the presentation. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yep, yep, yep. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Danny. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining me today and in this um, alumni se speaker series. It's a pleasure to be here back again, and it's one of those things I've been wanting to do for quite a while, quite a long time, and you know, to really give back to CSUSB and particularly to the MBA office, you know, for all the support, you know, Ernie, Kirsten, Molly, DeLoren, and all the rest of the team, you know, thank you again for, for giving me this uh, platform. So uh, let's jump right into it. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so a little bit about myself. Um, I graduated in May, 2021 with a 4.0. I was pursuing a dual MBA degree, uh, cybersecurity and global supply chain management. At around the same time, I also um, earned my Security Plus certification for cybersecurity. And just um, just a couple of weeks ago, I earned my GSEC um, from the GIAC, uh, the SANS Institute. Um, on the side, um, I also do professional photography, which includes portraits, uh, graduation photos, uh, weddings, events, and so on. I've worked with a number of large clients before. Uh, based off of the Caribbean, uh, Coca-Cola, FIFA, Maybelline, UNICEF, Oceana, and many others. Uh, what I'm doing now, um, recently I'm, I received a scholarship from the SANS Institute to pursue several um, certifications in cybersecurity. And so sort of on an expedited track, uh, that's, you know, that's why I got the GSEC recently. So I'm st still currently studying for some more. Uh, for the GSEC, it was grueling. It, it was... Uh, about 1800 pages worth of material. And we had about eight weeks to do it, but in reality, it's a little less than that because you have to prepare for your practice exams and so on. So it's more of five weeks to be ready. And then can the you, practice exams. Can you give us the acronyms and what they're associated with? Yeah, GSEC, um, it, it doesn't really stand exactly for anything, but it's security essentials um, for, for GAC. GAC is, um, I, don't, I don't really remember what it stands for. I should know this. But uh, it, it's just so commonly used that we don't really use the long names. We just use the, the, the abbreviated acronyms. But I'm sure you could Google it and you could find out. Um, but it's, it's very well renowned uh, in, in the industry. GSEC is very well respected. They have really top-notch instructors um, at, their, at their institute. The only thing, the only caveat is it's really, really expensive to, to, to go for those certifications. Usually you would be working and then you would um, have your employer pay for your certifications. They go around for about $2,000 per certification. And if you're going for the course, it's about 6,000 for the course. So it's it's pretty hefty, right? Out of pocket if you're gonna do that. Usually, like I said, you have your employer do that for you. Um, also, um, what, what I'll be doing in a couple of weeks is that um, I'll be teaching at the University of Redlands. Thank you, Ernie, for that referral. Um, that was, <laughs> That was something that you know was really helpful. I'll be teaching uh, supply chain management, and it's going to be my first time leading a class. I've been a graduate uh, teaching assistant before, but not the first time. You know, not not really leading the class by myself. So I'll be very very interesting. Uh, a few more fun facts about me: I really enjoy hiking. I really enjoy the outdoors. Um, just to, to, just to disconnect from everything else and just be one with Mother Nature. It's it's something that really recharges me, and it's something that I really. Um, you know, hold, hold dear to my heart, right? It's something that helps me clear my mind and, and my mental health and so on. I also really enjoy uh, fitness and staying healthy. I think health and wealth really go strong, strongly together. It's something that it, it's, it's need, needed to be put in practice a lot more and, and you, you can't neglect that part. You know, health is very much con connected with your, your wealth. Um, there's no shortage of materials as well for learning, right, which I really enjoy. Rather than spending, you know, an hour or two or something in 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 social media or whatever, open up a, a LinkedIn Learning. Right, you have that resource as a student for free, and you know, just just find something that you would be interested in that that might help you 
later on, right? So it's something that is a great resource as a student. You have so many resources as a student, right? You have, if you look at the, the library databases, um, I didn't I didn't know about the, some of these databases until the latter part of my degree, and I wish I would have known before. There's so many, so many things that you could go into and just, you know, use, you know, without a, a subscription fee, right? So, so that's definitely something that would uh, benefit you. All right, so let's uh, let's move on. Enough about me. Let's move on to the next slide. So, as a disclaimer, I have to really uh, explicitly say this because uh, uh, you know I'm, I'm talking about personal finance and investments and so on. And I'm not a certified financial planner or advisor. All opinions are expressed as on my own. I'm not affiliated with any of the uh, vendors or, or sponsored with any of the vendors or, or brands that are discussed today. All information being discussed is for educational and informational purposes only. I cannot be held liable for any uh, decisions you make on your part or any losses that you may incur uh, with your decisions. Past performance does not indicate uh, and is not indicative of future results. Please consider seeking advice from your own financial and investment advisor. All right, with that out of the way, let's jump into the next slide. All right, so in today's agenda, um, so most of what we'll discuss today is basically scratching the surface. And my intent is just to get that ball rolling and at least have some sort of idea of how things work for you, right? How, how you could to try to, to get into this if this was something that you've always been wanting to do, but been putting off for from the side or whatever. So uh, some of the things that we'll be discussing today is uh, interest versus growth, uh, what your risk appetite is, you know, what comfort level are you in with your risk? Now, what is a market index, right? We hear that all the time when you're, you're talking to people and they're like, okay, what, what's a market index, right? Let's get familiar with that. Uh, what are ETFs? What are active and passive ETFs? Uh, we could talk a little bit about IRAs, uh, credit cards, and, and cyber hygiene, and, and, and a, you know, a few tips to show you how it's connected to your finances. And hopefully we have some time for, for some Q&A. All right, so let's dive right into it. All right, so we'll start off with some interest versus growth. Uh, interest versus growth are two very overarching approaches on how you want to allocate your funds. And on one hand, we have the interest, and if you see on the left side, um, these are like saving accounts. These are CDs, bonds, and so on. And you would usually see these as fixed income as well, uh, particularly bonds. You will see banks would have um, also something called FDIC, which, uh, which is insurance for, for your funds up to $250,000. Uh, credit unions have uh, something equivalent called the NCUA, which is... Uh, which, which you know protects you in case that they go bankrupt tomorrow, right? If they collapse or whatever, you know at least your funds will be safe up to the, the, the two hundred and fifty thousand cap, right? So let's say for example you want to have something in, in more of a safe, low risk type of thing. So you would go for interest slash uh, fixed income. So uh, a good example would be a, a, a CD, right? You open a certificate of deposit for a two year and it pays you say three percent APY, right? And then at the end of the year, two years you know exactly how much you would earn, right? It's it's very predictable, it's very stable. And general, generally, it's considered very low risk, right? It's it's not much that you would lose off of it, especially if you have the FDIC um, insurance there. If you're gonna do anything above that, then you would just wanna just split that into various institutions, right? Two, 250,000 here, 250,000 there. I personally don't have that much of money, so I don't have to really worry about that. <laughs> um, so, you know, with low risk, you do get low return. And however, there are exceptions. Uh, right now, for example, you could buy up to uh, $10,000 in Series I bonds. These are directly from the government. Um, they're very, very low risk. Uh, they'll pay you interest uh, at the, in the rate of, of, of um, inflation right now. Infl you know, we're hearing the news cycle that inflation is getting out of hand. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's crazy right now, right? So. So if you buy bonds that are going according to the rate of inflation, you're keeping up with inflation. And at, at right now, the, the rate is at, um, at 9.62. And that's on, based on the CPI data that we see. Um, it changes every so often, but the Series I, they, they take that figure every about six months generally, and they change that. Um, so right now it's really close to that 10% uh, rate, annual rate of return, which is really good for a really low risk type of um, type of investment, right? It's ex excellent for you if you're 
you're you have some money on the side and you want to just put you know put it and just let it grow right mm -hmm. even if the, so even if the inflation number drops to zero or even negative you don't lose what you put in so if you put in that 10,000 you don't lose that even if it goes negative in terms of the inflation in you, some european countries and so on you would see negative inflation in certain periods of time where you would put money in the bank and you would have less money in a year's time so that's negative inflation uh, you know that's a whole different discussion on, on, on economics and finance and, and how that works but for for today just know that you could go into to, to the treasury direct i have a qr code right there for you as well if you want to scan it you can go ahead and buy up to ten thousand dollars in electronic uh, uh series i bonds uh it's ten thousand per person per year so if you haven't filed your taxes yet for for the year you can go ahead and do that you do have an additional five thousand if you want to in in paper bonds but that is going to come from your your tax return right and you have your tax return your tax refund um you could allocate up to five thousand and then if you want to you don't have to put the full full amount of your, your tax refund say for example you want to have um two hundred dollars only right then you could allocate that two hundred dollars towards that and to do that you would need to for uh, file form 8888 from the irs i have a qr code there as well if you want to read more about that um uh, there are in increments of fifty dollars so you could you could buy you know two hundred dollars two fifty a thousand whatever whatever works for you and whatever your your tax refund is and what's great about this is also that it compounds semi semi-annually and the rate changes again uh, rate changes every six months or so based on the cpi data um uh, I, I I personally wish it was a little more more frequent than a semi annually, but you know it's it's good enough, right? Uh, you cannot cash out in the first year. So a few caveats I want to go into is that you once you put it in, the first year you cannot withdraw. You know you cannot take it out. It's locked in there for that first year. But starting from year two to year five, you could cash out, but you're going to forfeit the last three months of interest. So whatever you've been earning the last three months. You're gonna, you know, subtract from from that amount. But starting year six, you could withdraw without any sort of penalties. So which is great. And then the bonds itself, they mature uh, in for you know for thirty has a maturity of thirty years. So you know, you could take it out at the end of thirty years. You know, by that time it'll be growing and growing, and you'll be seeing that your account would be going, you know, going up. And like I said, every year you put 10,000. So you could imagine how much that would grow in, in 30 years, right? Or, okay, so let's move on to the growth side. On the right side of the screen, you'll see uh, things like stocks and ETFs. These are less predictable things and they could be much more volatile and higher risk depending on what you choose to allocate your funds into. There are no guarantees, of course. Uh, there's no FDIC or anything like that. Uh, you could be very, very aggressive. You could be you know, very low risk as well, depending on what you allocate your funds into. You have a larger allocation of, you know, higher stocks if you're younger because you have a longer time horizon. We'll we'll talk a little bit about that in the other slides. Um, you could reduce your risk by purchasing ETFs that track like an index, for example, right? We'll touch on index as well, index funds in the upcoming slide. But just to show, uh, just to show you, or actually just to show, have, a, have you show, a, 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 you know, raise your hand, who has an interest account? uh in in this particular who's part of participating today who has an interest account anyone no no interest accounts no cds no savings accounts would the summer saver be part yeah, of that yeah. that's it yeah. yeah that's it yeah i actually have a pro tip there that talks about summer saver because it's it's really high right now at four percent apy you know, so it's it's a really low risk investment. Uh, well, I wouldn't call it investment, but just a, way, a place to park your money and just to get some some interest off of it. So that's good. Um, anyone has a growth account, you know, stocks or a brokerage or anything like that? Uh, show of hands, anyone? All right. All right, we got a couple of people that do have growth accounts. All right, we could move on to the next slide. All right, so what's your risk appetite, right? Let's talk a little bit about risk. Now, remember what we said, uh, low risk usually means low return, right? The higher the risk also means a higher return. Now, how comfortable are you with your risk, right? How do you feel about your investments if they go down? 
5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, right? What about 50%? Your mm-hmm. investment, your portfolio just get caught in half, right? How, how, how do you feel? You know, can you, can you have the stomach for it, right? How do you, how do you feel? So what level of risk, you know, are you comfortable with and, and would put you in a, a potential to even double your money if you put it into a higher risk, but it's higher risk, high reward. So I would like you to, um, to go ahead and put in the chat, how comfortable are you with, with your level of risk from a 0% to 100%? Go ahead and put it in the chat and let, let's take a look at some of the responses here, right? All right, we see Chris at 30%. Okay, George or Jorge, 20%. Kristen, 20%. All right. So, I mean, if it's something, Sandra, 20%, if it's something that is, is high risk, we, we know it's a high reward, right? High risk, high reward, low risk, low reward. All right. We're seeing numbers come in. 50%. All right. 70%. Rudy, all right. You're, 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 you're up there. And so there are many considerations to really think about. And there's two main considerations, right? You're your finances and your comfort, uh, your comfort level with risk. For your finances, I'll touch on one of them right now. Uh, your, your, what are your other resources, right? Do you have a lot of cash or cash equivalents that you hold? Maybe you have real estate. Maybe you hold uh, crypto. You know, crypto, uh, which was out of hype, but right now it's it's just shooting all the way down right now. Um, precious metals. You know, do you hold gold? Do you have gold bars at home? Do you have silver? You know, what, what do you have? What other assets do you have? What other finances? or other resources that you have that you don't, you know, not part of the, 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 the stock market, right? These are called asset, uh, asset classes, right? So the next consideration, um, what's your time horizon? Well, how, how much time do you have? Are you in your 20s? Are you in your 30s, 40s? You know, if you're in your 20s, you have about roughly 40 years until you retire, right? So you have a longer time horizon. You have plenty of time. And the general rule is that the market, the, aver- the market average stock uh, return is about 10% per year, but you do lose about two to 3% on, you know, due to inflation and so on. So effectively you're getting an average about 7% annually, right? Which means you're doubling your money every 10 years or so. So in, in, in 40 years, um, you could do the math, right? 40 years, you have more time to double your money, right? You, you, you basically have a long time horizon. And this is, this is based on uh, historical uh, data, right? So the last 80 years or so, this is what we've seen. And so on that vein, if you're closer to a retirement, you want to be less re- aggressive, right? You want to invest in things that are lower risk. You want to move some of your assets from the more aggressive to, so, you know, maybe go into bonds, you know, or go into a CD or something if you're closer to retirement. But, but you know, but because the, there's so many fluctuations, large fluctuations year to year, you know, going when you're closer to retirement, it's it's troubling to see your 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 portfolio going 20, 30 percent, even even 50 percent down, and you're almost retiring, right? I, I have some people that I know that are you know are are you know uneasy about that because they're they're close to retirement and their their portfolio is down 30 percent because they're being very very aggressive in their in their holdings. But you know, eventually market will go up. But how much time do you have for for that, right? So. Um, we could we could move on to the next slide. All right. So on that vein, also uh, because you really want to take uh, take a look at at what your time horizon is, and for this year, uh, year to date, right, from January to 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 September, we're down about twenty percent. Stock market is down right now and, and it's it's you know a lot of us are feeling the pain right but at the same time um one one, one famous person said you know what, what your your greed is is my my is is i can't remember what they're saying is but you know if the market is down you have the opportunity to buy low basically you buy low and you could sell high you know and so you know, people panic and they sell, right? They panic sell and that's how they lose money. You don't lose your money until you actually sell. And so that's your realized, what we call a realized loss. You, you have unrealized losses if you're holding, but you're, you're, you're down on your, in, 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 or or your portfolio, right? You don't really actually lose it until you actually sell it. So if we look at the, the chart here, the, the S&P 500, we'll talk a little bit more about the index in a, in a few minutes. There's huge fluctuations, right? Year to date, we see it's down 20%. Uh, and that's what we usually call uh, the market S&P 500. That's what we refer to when we talk about the market. And 
you know, it's scary, right? It's scary for 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 new investors are like, wow, I don't want to lose 20% of my portfolio, right? And so let's move to the next slide. And we would take a look at, at a longer time horizon, a longer time period. So this is five years, right? Five years. And we look at what the data shows here was was when the S&P 500, when Vanguard was actually started with the VOO ETF, uh, 2017 September and to, to, you know, to today, September 2022, it's five years. So at five years, we see how much about almost 55% return, right? If you have five years, but the general rule based on historical data is that any rolling five years, right? You pick any five years uh, and you look at the S&P 500, you come up positive at the end of that five years there's a 90% chance that you would come up positive, right? Yeah. Whatever the, 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 the slice of time that you want to pick out, that's up to you, you know, 2017 to 2022, 2010 to 2015, you know, you pick any slice of five years and you will see there's a 90% chance that you would come up positive. So that also brings me to my next point, right? Um, if you have a large purchase, right? If you're thinking about buying a house in the next five years, you know, and you're wanting to save up for that, that, uh, that, that down payment. The stock market is not probably not a good place for you to, to put that money for, for, for that time, you know, within the five years, right? Because there's so much volatility. You could be losing a lot of money within that time. But if you have more than five years, right? If you have retirement that, you know, you're not going to touch money for the next 10, 20, 30 years, stock market is a brilliant place to, to put your market, your, your money, because the market, you know, eventually it goes up. It has, you know, downs and it has its ups. It's, it's going to go up eventually, but you're going to take some time. So that's, that's something that you would really want to take into consideration. So on that vein also is that with, if it's within the five years that you're thinking that you're going to invest your money, might as well just put it into like a CD, right? You could play it safe for, for that. So you don't, want to, you don't want to gamble with a little too much. You could put a small amount into it, depending on what your, your risk appetite is. But you know, generally in the, the five-year range, go with, go with safer, lower risk. So let's expand that a little bit, right? So let's say um, uh, we could go on to the next slide. All right. So let's say uh, we, we, we take a look at an example, right? Let's expand a little bit. Um, September uh, in the morning uh, of 2020, 2010, right? Let's say you had like about $100 and some, some change and you decided to put some money into a low cost ETF, like, like the VOO over here that tracks the, S&P 500, and you left it there and you did nothing to it, right? You didn't take any money out. You didn't put any more, more money in there and it just sat there. Today, you know, after 12 years, that $100 in change that you put in there is now worth $354, right? Not bad, right? You have a return of about 250% in those 12 years. So, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty good, right? I would say it's pretty good. For me, I, I would say in 12 years, you made that much money. But let's say in those same 12 years, you decided to play it safe, right? You want to put that same amount into a CD instead, something low risk. And you, you know, you re, you, we don't really have a 12 year CD per se, but just hypothetically, you know, you re, say you renew it each time when it, you know, when it matures and you, you have the same rate. And let's say it's at 4%. I'll be very generous to you. 4% APY. Uh, same thing. You didn't put any money, more money in. You didn't take any money out. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so drum roll, and then next slide, please. All right, let's run to the next slide. All right, so this is what it would look like, right? You you have $100 in change, and then at the end of the 12 years, you have $164 in change, right? What your your, your return is, is total return is 61.48, roughly, uh, you know? So the compounding, is, is, a, is a big factor into this. But again, it's low risk, right? You don't have to worry about, you know, you don't have to have sleepless nights about, you know, whether your money is going to be lost or whatever, right? But it's playing it safe. But you could see the contrast between having it in a safe place versus having it in something like a stock market. Um, we could go on to the next slide. So again, what's what's the market index, right? I mean, we hear that quite a bit. And and you know, people get confused. You know, this is just is just too much for me. I can't I can't process all of this. This is too much jargon. This is too much things that you know it, it's too technical for me, right? So so generally speaking, when 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 people are talking about the market, they could refer to any one of these three indexes, and these are very popular. The three most popular indexes, 
and you often often see these quoted in in you know whatever uh, financial shows or talk shows or whatever or you see boards reading these so these are the Dow Jones Industrial Average which is uh, abbreviated as DJIA the S&P 500 index and the Nasdaq Composite index and think of these as barometers right they're measuring instruments of telling us of, of how the how the economy well I wouldn't say the economy because the economy is disconnected from stock market but how the how the stock market is doing right now right how does it how does the status of it looks like you know is it bad is it good you know each have their each of them have their own idiosyncrasies and very quickly just to touch on them the DJIA is comprised of 30 very large uh, US companies it was created back in the eight, uh, 19, 18, 1896 uh, back then there were like 12 companies and you know they had you know stocks of companies that were like uh, railroad gas and and, and tobacco and sugar and that sort of stuff, you know, stuff that was prominent at that time, right? And it, it gets rebalanced every so often. I think for the for the DJIA, I think it rebalances about once annually, I believe. And then the other two are rebalanced quarterly, meaning, you know, companies are taken out and then new companies are putting in depending on a strict criteria that each of them would have. Um, so often like, you know, newcomers come in and then, you you know, they, they meet the criteria and then so they get added to it. Some companies maybe go bankrupt, so they take them off. Um, and so the next one is S&P 500, which is a, comp you know, a composition of about 500 publicly traded companies. And there are certain criteria they have to meet, you know, you have to make, uh, make a consecutive profit every year for five quarters or something like that. I don't remember exactly. And again, that's the most popular index when people are referring to the market. This is what they're referring to. And it's very diverse. The S&P 500 has 11 different sectors in like tech, health, uh, utilities, energy, real estate. Uh, you know, so, so you, could, you, could, you could Google that and you could see all, all 11 sectors. And lastly, we have the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ composite is about 3,700 3, companies. And of that 3,700 companies, there is the top 100, what we call the NASDAQ 100. These are non-financial companies, very large market cap, uh, what we call the NASDAQ 100. And these are very tech heavy, right? They're very concentrated in, in tech. We have, you know, these are where your Apple is, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, uh, Tesla, uh, Meta. And then so it's, it's very geared towards that particular sector. And we'll see a, a pie chart later on, uh, see how concentrated it is. So we can move on to the, to the next slide. All right, so there's a pie chart if you want to take a look. Um, so what are ETFs, right? Uh, you know, having an understanding of what the index is, it helps you understand what an ETF is as well. So think about uh, ETF as a basket of different stocks, right? A basket of, of, of whatever stocks is in the index. Some track the index. So you, you, you have almost a one-to-one -one, um, uh, stock in, in, in the ETF that matches the index. The index you can't really buy directly because it's sort of like a reference. Like I told you, it was a barometer, but you can buy an ETF that tracks that particular barometer, right? And then you have a sort of a very diverse set of stocks in that particular ETF that trades as if it was an individual stock. So um, again, it, it's like a basket of different stocks. And specifically, they could track uh, those indexes or it could track different sectors, right? You want to buy something in tech, you could buy something in tech, right? That, that invests, uh, you know, holds all the big tech companies and so on. You buy something that is geared towards maybe bond or the, the US market on a whole or the world market, right? You would buy something that is uh, geared towards growth or towards ESG. ESG is, is well, you know, it was a sort of a big hype. Uh, these are companies that support like uh, clean energy, climate change, social, socially conscious and so on. And they address things that are, are you know in, in their governance you know do they have female uh, board members and so on so that's very really important for for a lot of people and certain companies uh, that meet those criteria can be added into an ESG ETF uh, one thing to note about is that there's a huge inflows in ETFs right people don't want to buy individual stocks and they just want to just buy an ETF let them handle it right you have a diverse the more you diversify the better because if one particular company goes bankrupt Guess what, right? If you have stock in that one particular company, you you might lose a lot of money or maybe all your money, money, right? But the chances of the S and P five hundred, you know, all collapse at the same time are very, 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 very slim, right? Chances are you're 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 gonna be pretty, excuse me, pretty safe in the S and P five hundred. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. We could talk a little bit about active and passive ETFs. 
So there's some pros and cons to each, right? In the world of ETFs. Um, for me, I have a mix of both, right? Uh, both of my ETFs are more on the passive side because they are low, low cost. And what I mean by low cost is that they have something called an expense ratio, right? And we, in the next slides, we'll talk a little bit about expense ratios as well. So let's take a little, little closer look at the pros and cons of each. Keep in mind that, uh, you know, that passive ETFs are more of uh, algorithms and, 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 and AI that is taking over to, to make those trades, right? You don't have people hands-on that are making those trades. It's, it's all fed into this algorithm that they make those decisions. And so because of that, you have lower costs because you don't have people actively, actively making those trades, right? For example, I have the e, uh, v, e, VOO earlier that tracks the S&P 500. Now the VOO tracks the index. And so it's low cost. You know, it's probably one of the cheapest ones because Vanguard is known for having very, very cheap, uh, low cost ETFs, right? So say, for example, um, that same example of VOO, it's 0.03%, what we call three basis points, right? So that means for every $10,000, you're only paying them $3 a year to manage your money. That is considered very, very cheap. It's very, very efficient. And you don't have to worry about uh, paying large amounts of money to, to, to active management. So we look at active, you know, so why, why do you have active then? I mean, if, if it's so, so great about passive. Well, active has its own advantages as well, right? There's more customization. You know, like I said, you have uh, places that you could buy only one particular um, um, sector, right? So say, for example, tech, right? Or you could buy something that is growth uh, oriented, right? So it's, it's more customization. You could, you could hone in on any one particular um, thing or one theme or what we call thematic ETFs. And you also have the ability to, to, to drop and, and, and the, the managers or the people who manages the ETF the team behind it, they could drop and they could add different uh, stocks in there as well to try to beat the market, right? It's it's trying to outperform the S&P itself. But that comes at a cost, right? It, it, it usually ranges between, you know, half a percent to maybe, you know, 3%, 4%. And sometimes I've seen them even, even higher than that. So it's a lot of money paying towards. You might feel like half a percent isn't much, but when it adds up and it compounds, it is quite a bit. So ETFs, like I said, from Vanguard are usually the lowest. Fidelity and Schwab are also very close as well. In fact, Fidelity has their, their Fidelity zero funds, which is a zero expense ratio. The only downside with, with that is that you would have to have a Fidelity account and you can't really transfer uh, those, those, those funds to another brokerage versus you know, something like a VOO from, from Vanguard. You could use any brokerage account and you could transfer those as you please. Um, I want to give an example with Warren Buffett back in 2008. He made a million dollar bet with, uh, with a hedge fund that hedge funds cannot beat the market, right? In a 10 year time span, right? And, and Buffett, to Buffett's point, what he's trying to say is that you can't consistently beat the market over and over. You might beat it one year, two year, three years, but you can't consistently do it over a period of time. And their bet ran from 2008 to 2018. And guess what? Warren Buffett won, right? He won the million dollars. In fact, the hedge fund that took up his offer by 2015, they were like, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, we lost the bet. You know, the, the bet didn't even finish and, and they conceded almost, right? So, you know, according to a 2020 report, um, over a 15 period, uh, year period, there's nearly a 90% chance of active, uh, actively managed investments fail to beat the market. And these are you know, really top-notch people, right? These are quants. These are people with multiple PhDs in statistics and they analyze charts and that's what they do day in, day out, 24 hours a day, right? They just grind at these numbers and yet they cannot beat the market, right? So, so just have something to think about. You know, you, it, it's, it's a failed quest to try to beat the market, uh, but yet we still have a lot of people that do it, right? Um, let's go to the next slide so we can talk a little bit about expense ratios. All right, so here's an example of a comparison between a low cost expense ratio and a not so low cost, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a calculator there. You could have a QR code if you want to try it out yourself. So in the ex example here, if you invest uh, $10,000 and you would put 1000 in it each month for, for the course of 30 years and say, for example, your return is 10% is 10, 10 per year, right? And how does that look, right? If you compare the different, uh, what, what your cost would be, it's quite significant, right? Over that 30 years, you're only paying $2,000 in change for, 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 for a, you know, 0.03% for something like a VOO 
versus maybe an active fund that charges a 0.75% for, for an actively managed fund. And look at the cost, right? $54,000 over the course of 30 years. It's a lot. The difference of $51,000. If you bump that up into a larger investment, I mean, you could really see how, how that makes a huge, huge impact, right? Uh, again, there's a QR code if you would like to scan it. We can move on to the next slide. Go ahead and click one more time, Kristen. Let's see if something comes up. There we go. All right, so some of you might still, still be confused, right? Or, or this is information overload. So if you're confused or information overload, go ahead and put it in the chat and go ahead and let me know that you're, you're, you're still not fully getting all these things. There's a lot of jargon and everything, right? This is, this is hard stuff, right? Danny, I'm still confused. You know, I don't, I, I just tell me what I need to do, right? The truth is, this stuff is not straightforward, right? This stuff is, is, is hard. I mean, this is, I did not learn this overnight. And I didn't learn this in the classroom. I wish I did. I wish I learned it earlier. But this, this comes from a lot of self-learning and a reading and listening to podcasts and so on and applying what I learned, right? So there is, uh, however, a way of setting it and forgetting approach, right? And there's two I listed on here. There's something called a target retirement fund. Uh, this usually is with your retirement funds, uh, like a 401k or an IRA um, or a 403b if you're working for something like a school. Uh, with Fidelity, for example, you have the opportunity to choose a target retirement fund. What this does is, you know, you choose like a year that you would think you would be retiring. So if you're in your 20s, for example, so you have about 40 years of a time horizon. So you would choose something like a 2060 uh, retirement retirement fund, and and what that does is it automatically chooses uh, high risk stocks for you um, and it would slowly go into a lower risk stocks uh, and it tapers into that as you get closer to the year 2060, right? That's one approach. The next approach is that, you know, if you don't have a target retirement fund, you're in your brokerage account, for example, right? And so you would, you probably would select a few ETFs and I have a sample allocation here, right? Remember we talked about ETFs and how they track the index. So I, I listed on here, this is relatively, I would say relatively safe, but like a mid-tier safe. Um, you can buy some VOO that tracks the, the S&P 500. You can have the VTI uh, that tracks the total US market, or you could have something that is uh, VXUS, which is all the stock market outside of the US. You wanna have a little bit of exposure uh, to, to that because you don't, you don't ever know if the US uh, market might collapse, which I don't think it would, but you, know, you would have an exposure to international markets with VXUS. There's also QQQ or QQQM. The difference is that the QQQM is a newer fund, but the expense ratio is a little, uh, little less than the QQQ. The QQQ is a tried and true. If you want to go for that, the expense ratio for that is 0.2. Uh, QQQM is 0.15, so it's a five basis point difference that tracks the Nasdaq 100. It's a little more volatile because you have you know growth and, and tech in there. But at the same time, you have a larger return, you know, high risk, high return. And then you have uh, the VT or, or, or uh, yeah, total mark, stock market. Uh, you could either have that one or the, or the uh, VXUS. So it, it, it helps that you have a little bit of diversification. So there's also something called do dollar cost averaging, right? And timing the market is, is just not, not good. Like I told you, you're going to have PH, multiple PhDs trying to time the market and trying to buy and sell and so on. And you know, doesn't always work out consistently. So what dollar cost averaging does is that you just, you, you set an amount that you think you would put on every month. Say for example, I'm thinking of putting uh, $1,200 a year. And so you would divide that up into 12, you know, ch different chunks and you put a hundred dollars, right? And then from that hundred dollars, you can allocate it into the different funds that you have in your portfolio. And you know that that this is a really tried and true way of just putting in money, whether the the market is high or low, you just keep on putting it and consistently doing so. And since you know there's a lot of fractionals that you could you know buy into, you are allowed to you know buy fractional of a VOO or a VTI rather than buying the whole stock, which is you know cost much more. You know unless you have a larger amount of money that you put in there, you may not be able to buy you know without the fractional uh, feature. We can move on to the next slide. All right, so a little bit about oh, IRAs or individual retirement accounts. So normally your limit is 6,000 a year that you could contribute and the, you, you know, at the time that you pay your taxes or file your taxes. 
meaning you can contribute up to 6,000 mark for 2022 uh, on and the last day to do so is April 15th, uh, 2023 of your tax day. So if you filed your taxes, then whatever that date is, is your last day to put in into that particular IRA account. But if you choose the, there's two different ways, right? There's a traditional IRA and there, there, there's a Roth and this often gets confused and which is which, right? The case for choosing a Roth over traditional is if you think you're in a lower tax bracket right now uh, than you are in the future, then you would want to go with the Roth because you're paying the taxes up front and you're in a lower tax bracket. So by the time you do want to make those withdrawals later on, you are not taxed at that particular rate in the future, right? But you know, same same thing with the opposite applies. If you think you're in a in a higher your your peak earnings right now, you're in a uh, higher tax bracket, and, and when you're in your 60s or so on, you would be in a lower tax bracket, then by all means, go for the traditional. Uh, mostly for younger people like myself, you just would put it into a Roth because we're not at our peak earnings yet, right? And so for a, there, there are some limits, right? There's uh, for a single filer, if you, you can be earning more than 144,000. Um, anyone here that is earning more than 144,000 or jointly 214,000, if that, is, if that is the case, there is a loophole that we call a backdoor Roth that you would put your money into a traditional, which doesn't have those income limits, and then you would convert that into a Roth. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's one of those things that are, are probably being um, discussed right now in, 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 in the government, whether they're going to close that loophole. So if you're earning that much money, go ahead and put that much in. You know, you could, you could, that's, that's a way that you could do it. Also, if you're 50 years or older, you could put up to 7,000 a year. So those are your limits. I also have um, a QR code there if you want to read more about the limits. Uh, a pro tip also is that if you're, you're young, um, you would want to put more growth stocks and, and high dividend stocks in your Roth IRA because you're limited to that 6,000 a year, right? And whatever you're earning within that could compound within itself. So growth works really well. High dividend also, whatever dividends that you receive, they don't count towards your taxes, right? You're, 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 you're just earning tax-free growth on that particular account. We can also move to, on to the next slide. So credit cards, you know, um, slight change, uh, slight switching of gears here. There's pros and cons to credit cards. Uh, we could have a whole different talk about credit cards, but I wanna note that as a student, you, got a, you have a lot of different advantages. Credit card companies want you want to have your credit card. Have you have your credit card because it's a huge market share for them, right? As long as you are responsible in using a credit card and you know how to use it to your advantage, you can make money off of it. For example, like uh, cash back and so on, you have different protections as well that you would not have with your debit card. Debit cards, you would only use if you're going to the ATM. Apart from that, never use your, your, your debit card because you don't have protections. If there's fraud or anything being used, you know, you don't have any protections. Uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I logged into a, a website that I purchased something before and I noticed a, a fraudulent charge, right? I never, I didn't make, I haven't logged into this account for maybe several months, nine months, six months, I don't know. But I saw a charge two weeks ago. I was like, okay. And then it was shipping to, to, to Chicago. I don't, I don't know anyone in Chicago. And, you know, it, then I, I filed a complaint with my credit card and they, they took it off immediately. You can't do that with a debit card. And, and stuff like Zelle, for example, it's very, very dangerous. I would say Zelle is not something that you would want to use unless you're, you're just putting it, uh, you're transferring money to someone that you know, like a family member or a friend. Apart from that, don't use Zelle for any of those. They don't have the same protections as credit cards. Credit cards by law has a lot of protections that you don't have to um, worry about, right? You could just file a claim and you could get that money back. There's also a really good promo going on with uh, Discover. Um, they're giving students, um, uh, I have QR codes there. There's two QR codes for students. You have the opportunity to get $100 towards your, 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 your statement credit if you spend money, any, any amount of money in the first three months um, after applying and approved. Um, and the next link we have there is for $50 for anyone. You could apply for both. You know, as a student, you can apply for both. And these, these are really beneficial to you because you get 10% cash back. That's money on the table, right? You, you know, in certain categories, of course. You know, if you, you buy from Amazon or you, you buy groceries, restaurants, gas stations, you know, you're using PayPal, you know, you, you, you could, you know, get 10%. That's, that's pretty good, right? And if you're, you're making good grades, you could get an extra $20 per year. You just, you know, contact them via you know, their, their customer service chat 
and let them know, hey, I'm, I want to claim my good grades. All right, you can do that up to five years. You know, that's a hundred dollars right there. And it's really, you know, I, I max it out. I max it out twenty twenty dollars a year. I get all the ten percent cash back. What they really do is a five percent that they they match you after you um, after you spend that in the in the first year. Um, I think your grades don't, don't you don't have to be an A student. You could be a B student and you could still get it. Right. I think. Uh, I don't remember what the process was. I think you do have to show some proof or, or it, it gives you some form that you have to fill out really quickly. It's like five minutes and you you are done. And it's 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 good. It's good for the rest of the year. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. I know we're a little tight on time. So cyber hygiene, uh, whenever wherever you go into a lot of these other webinars as well, or workshops, they talk about you know personal finance or, or financial literacy and investments, but we rarely talk about you know, you know, cybersecurity aspect of it. So I really want to bring that into this particular conversation uh, because I have a little bit of a background on it and I understand that you know it's a different discipline altogether, but yet again, it's very, very intertwined and it's very vital that we think about it. So we hear a lot about breaches and so on of big corporations. Uh, you know, recently we have uh, American Airlines that breached, right? Um, Uber, or, or, or you have other, you know, very large companies that, that, are, that are having these issues. And you might be asking, well, how does this affect me, right? Well, the answer is it may not affect you directly, immediately, but there's a negative impact on your life because you have information that these uh, attackers have, right? They have, they know exactly, you know, where you live, what your name is, what your social security number is, what your pet name is, and they could figure out your password, or even they just have your password, you know, with all these breaches, they have your password already. And so what are, what are protections that you have to do on your, on your side that could reduce that? I mean, if there's fraudulent charges, for example, I, as I mentioned before, but you still have to file a fraudulent charge. But imagine if your entire account gets emptied, right? How would you feel, right? And then and you have to deal with all the anxiety and, and all that. It, it's, uh, you don't want to deal with the hassle. But, so why not just have preventative measures in order to protect yourself? And so a few good practices I have listed there, you know, strong passwords, uh, password manager, you could enable MFA, multi-factor authentication. You could open an account with Credit Karma, uh, the SSA, you know, the Social Security. Um, freeze our account whenever you can with the three credit bureaus. Uh, perform regular backups, update your apps and, and, and software on your phone and on your, your computer. And try not to use public Wi-Fi if you don't have to. I have a quick um, comic there. Maybe you could uh, review it in later on if you want to take a quick screenshot. Um, how to get, you know, a stronger password. This still applies. Uh, length is more important. We, we'll go on to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit more about passwords. So changing passwords frequently is not a good way. I know it's a very old school way that uh, that was out there. Uh, changing passwords frequently is not a good practice because it tends to lead people to use weaker passwords so they can remember their passwords and people end up forgetting their passwords altogether, right? And so what you're, you should do rather is to have a longer password length over complexity. That's how I would see it. I'm still old school. I still put in some complexity into it, but at least have, I would say, a 14 character password. I know a lot of these, um, the minimum password requirement is like eight characters, but that is way too weak, way, way too weak. It's, they're easy to crack. Uh, I've, I've run software before because I'm, I'm taking the, the certification course and so on. Cracking eight, 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 eight character passwords is easy very easy. So have a stronger password. You know, all my, my, my more important accounts, I have 30 to 40 character passwords in that range, right? And you have a lot of complexity into it as well, if you would like to. If not, you could just have, you know, random words stitched together, like the, the comic we have before, right? Uh, you would never want to also re reuse your passwords because there's something called credential stuffing. Uh, what that does is that if they, they find out that one account that you have, let's say, for example, one bank, and they know what that password is, they will try to use that same username and password in another account. Or they try to, you know, put that, that password with a different username and they try all different sorts of combinations, right? Your software is software that, that does this stuff, right? They, they know the first capital letter and they put, you know, a number in the back or a symbol in the back. And that is like the, the basic scheme that we do when we crack passwords. So it's easy for us to know exactly the, the, the patterns that, that, that people commonly use. So for stuff like your financials, put something that is really strong. And then on top of that, you could use a password manager if you don't think you're gonna remember all your passwords, right? You, so that means you would just have to worry about one long password to access your password manager. 
and then you would have access to all your other passwords. I know you might be thinking, you know, is that safe? You have all, you know, one point that, you know, if someone hacks into your password manager, you know, what happens? But these are really safe and they don't actually, your passwords don't actually get uploaded to, to the password manager side. It stays local on your computer. It's very, very encrypted. It's, it's encrypted so many different times that it's really difficult for us to try to decrypt all those layers of decryption in order to get the actual password that you have stored in there. And you have options that you know could choose from, you know, LastPass, OnePassword, and uh, Bitwarden. That's more of an open source. Bitwarden is open source. We hear about LastPass getting breached and so on. Uh, there's it's still very unclear right now what what the attackers have. But for now, I would say you're still pretty safe. They don't have any um, actual vault information on your passwords, so it's pretty safe. I'd say you could still use it rather than not using it. We can jump into the next slide. All right, so MFA multi-factor authentication. Um, it helps you to use a, a, a second way of authenticating you are really who you are. So even if the attackers do have your password and they try to log in, they might be successful at that one step, but they don't have your, your code that you get, right? Um, not all MFA is, is the same. They're not all created equal. For example, if you're using, uh, using the MFA to send a text message to your phone via your, your carrier number, uh, it, it's really easy easy to be spoofed. Uh, you could we could you know attackers just call your carrier and they try to to act as if they were you and try to reset your number and they could just steal your number and get your 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 your, your um, intercept your 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 code basically, or they might just social engineer you and just try to get that out of you right. So there's other ways to to have a better or safer MFA. So you could use Google Voice. You could sign up for a Google Voice account, and it's much more difficult for an attacker to hack into your Google Voice and try to get that number from you. Um, also, another secure method is to use an authenticator app, like a Google Authenticator or Duo. I know we have Duo at CSUSB or Microsoft in, uh, Authenticator. So those are really good ways to do that. Your attacker would have to have your phone, and they would have to have that number right there and then for that 30 seconds or whatever. There's another very safe method, um, which is the hardware security token. This is like UB keys. Um, I, I don't think they're ready for prime time yet. I wish they would. Basically, it looks like a, a, a flash drive. Uh, Gmail allows you to use that. A lot of different other accounts, I wish they would, but they don't uh, allow that feature. What it does, instead of entering your numbers or pressing anything, you just put in that, that uh, like a flash drive in there, and you just press that yellow button in there, and you're good to go, right? It's a second way of getting there. I'm sure you could yeah, you could share. Uh, yeah, Kirsten, you could share that presentation with um, with, with the U YouTube and, and so on. Uh, let's move on to the next slide because I know we're very tight on time. Uh, very, very quickly back, uh, you, identity theft. You want to have uh, a social security account, uh, not because just for retirement purposes, but if you have an account, um, it's not as easy to to steal your identity because your your SSN and so on is in there, but you have protections in there as well. So your your attacker might not be able to to steal your your or, or apply for a loan, for example, under your name using your social security number as easily. So that brings me to my next point that you need to um to freeze your account, freeze your your credit. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't affect your credit score or anything. If you freeze it, no one can apply for different loans, right? You, no one can apply as if you they were you. Imagine you would just wake up one morning and see that you have a, you know, a, a fifty thousand dollar loan on your name, and you have to be responsible for it, right? That's that's not really a good feeling, right? So if you freeze your account, it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, when but you have to remember you have to fight every every time you want to apply for a new credit card or a new loan or whatever. So it's a small inconvenience, but it's it's well worth the hassle. You can also have a Credit Karma account to monitor uh, what, what credit is going on in, in your particular account, if any uh, credit cards or any you know, particular loans that you don't recognize. So you could see that. And you can also see your credit score there. I have a quick screenshot on there on there as well. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. Uh, go really quickly on that. Backups, you really want to do your manual backups as well if you're on Windows. Um, ransomware is a big, big issue right now. There's links being sent to your email, or if you say, for example, I got fished recently, right? I won some competition or some some sweepstakes thing, and the the attacker acted as if they were the account of the the, the people who are giving the prize, right? And they sent me this link, and I was like, oh, okay, because I I knew the owner of the particular um, business, and and they were 
I was like, okay, I should have used my instincts and my gut feeling and actually call the owner. Hey, did I really win this? But rather than trusting that account, sending me that link, right? Uh, with Mac OS, you have a lot more flexibility as well and very much more convenience with Time Machine. You know, you back up everything. One, one thing I do is I have three different uh, external drives for my Mac, uh, uh, for my uh, Time Machine. I never plug in more than one at one particular time because if I do get ransomware at any point in time, that one particular hard drive would get encrypted, but not my other two, right? So that's a method that I use. Uh, always keep your, your, your stuff like your browser and your apps up to date if you can. Uh, because they do have security um, things that they, they updated, uh, security patches that they updated with those updates. Um, last slide, um, we can move on to public Wi-Fi, right? Try not to use Starbucks Wi-Fi or any Wi-Fi. When I hear people say, hey, what's a Wi-Fi password, right? I, I almost cringe, right? It's it's very unsafe. It's You can always have a hacker in there and they could just monitor that traffic. They see everything that you see, right? Once you connect and you log into to anything, they could see everything that you see, all, all your data being you know, intercepted, basically. Uh, so there are protections in, in more uh, recent technologies, but at, at the same time, not everyone is updated with their devices and so on. So there are very, uh, very real risks on there. If you have to use public Wi-Fi, use a VPN, right? There's VPNs out there that you can use that encrypts your traffic and it helps, it, it you know, significantly helps you from getting intercepted, your, your, your stuff intercepted. And lastly, we'll go into the Q&A slide. I do want to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you could uh, unmute yourself and you can go ahead and ask me those questions. I know it's a lot of information to process, right? It's a information overload. I try to try to cover all, all these different topics. And you know, maybe we could even have a part two some other time to, to cover some other things. I have a question then. Sure. Um, I did not know that you can freeze your credit. Mm -hmm. When you freeze it for how long is it fr frozen? Or can you kind of like do it like when you lose a credit card where you block your or freeze your credit card and then is it the same thing? It's similar. Can we go on to that, that slide, Kristen? So um, freezing, freezing your credit doesn't have a time limit. You could freeze it as long as you want, and then you unfreeze it whenever you don't. It doesn't affect you spending your credit card, right? If you go ahead and make your purchase, it doesn't affect you um, using your credit card. It affects nothing like that. It only affects you if you try to apply for like a car loan or, or any sort of loans, then you would have to go in into that particular account, and then you unfreeze it. You just have to enter your your information and maybe ask for a pin code, right? And then you 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 could set how long I want to unfreeze it for, right? I could unfreeze it for a week or two weeks, and it takes about five minutes or so or ten minutes that it, it it you know after you you went through the whole process, then you have the ability to to apply for credit, right? So that means the attacker would have to know your 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 credentials to log into that account and unfreeze it in order to apply a loan as you. Uh, I hope that thank answers you. your question. Does it? Yes. Thank you so okay. much. Mm -hmm. Okay. We had a hand raised from Rudy as well. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, something I didn't quite get is what's the value in the backdoor strategy? I, and the reason I don't I don't get it is if the main benefit of the Roth IRA is because you think your tax bracket is going to remain high when you take the money out. And, I mean. Once you retire, because you no longer have an income, does your tax bracket automatically become lower? Yes and no. Uh, depends on how you look at it. Say, for example, you're making 144000 right? But you're not at your peak yet. You still have, say, for example, $250,000 at your peak, you think, right? So, so it, it goes for the Roth, right? You could still go for the Roth. Because at, so at the time you retire, maybe you have other sources of income as well. Maybe you invested in real estate and you're getting a monthly rent from someone, right? Or you have other sources of income that comes in, right? So you have to evaluate on yourself and make that decision and say, I think I'm going to be making more or I'm, I'm, I'm going to be making less at that particular time. So I, I guess that's probably the answer is if, if you're planning on, on your, your job being your main source of income, then your tax bracket will most likely drop. If you're planning right. on having some type of passive income, then it will probably remain high. Right, right. Exactly. That, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right, thank you so much. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know we have class coming up for some students. So um, thank you so much, Danny. Um, if everyone is interested in maybe doing this again, um, let me know and we can ask Danny back to do maybe a part two. Um, but thank you for showing up. This will go onto our YouTube and I will make the slides available to you if you send me an email. Um, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to stay back if anyone has questions. So, um, Kristen, I don't know if you're okay with that or you're on a tight schedule.